Chester Bennington rose to rock star fame in 2000 with Linkin Park's Grammy-winning debut album Hybrid Theory. Though Bennington was candid about his personal connection to the angst in his music, the frontman's tragic death in July 2017 came as a shock to the music world and suggests that his demons ran deeper than fans realized. Let's take a closer look at the untold truths that tormented and inspired this influential and talented musician. Childhood Pain in a 2008 interview with Krang, Bennington opened up about his personal life, revealing how early abuse and his parents' divorce deeply affected his childhood. I was getting beaten up and being forced to do things I didn't want to do. It destroyed my self-confidence. Like most people, I was too afraid to say anything. Bennington eventually found an outlet through his first band, Grey Days, marking the beginning of a music career that went on to inspire millions. Unfortunately, it wasn't a completely smooth start, and he looked for an escape in drugs, reaching the point where he was abusing meth, opium, and LSD before he'd even hit age 17. In a 2011 interview with The Guardian, he said, I remember that stuff happening to me at that stage, and even thinking about it now makes me want to cry. Rock Bottom to Rock Legend At the age of 23, Chester Bennington moved to Los Angeles and joined an unknown band that called themselves Zero. Warner Brothers passed the group over three times before reluctantly signing it in 1999, and the band changed their name to Linkin Park. At the time, Bennington was essentially homeless and living out of his car. He told Rolling Stone, It wouldn't go over 35 miles an hour. Two lights were burned out. I had no money to replace them. Despite being a late addition to the tight-knit band, Bennington's dedication motivated the group. Guitarist Brad Delson told Rolling Stone, We each made our own sacrifices, but Chester's was unique. Because he had so much to risk, he was extremely motivated. He would actually tell us, Guys, I don't think we're working hard enough. The band's efforts eventually paid off. Linkin Park's debut, Hybrid Theory, became the best-selling album of 2001. Early Success Despite their success, Bennington still felt isolated from the rest of Linkin Park and soon spiraled into addiction. His drug use got so bad that Bennington's bandmates finally staged an intervention. Bennington opened up to Team Rock about those dark times, saying, I had no idea that I had been such a nightmare. I knew that I had a drinking problem, a drug problem, and that parts of my personal life were crazy, but I didn't realize how much that was affecting the people around me until I got a good dose of, here's what you're really like. It was a shock. They said that I was two people, Chester and then that f***ing guy. I didn't want to be that guy. With the support of his bandmates, Bennington got his act together and put his focus back on making music. The Cyberstalker With new fame came new fans, and with new fans came a whole new world of crazy. In 2006, a cyberstalker began terrorizing Bennington and his second wife, Talinda. The female stalker reportedly called the couple at random hours of the night and made terrifying remarks like, I know where your kids are, and I have complete control of your lives. The stalker turned out to be a woman named Devon Townsend, an obsessive Linkin Park fan and an employee at Sandia National Laboratories, a nuclear weapons facility in Albuquerque, New Mexico. When confronted at work, Townsend told the investigator that she had terrorized the Benningtons for months because she was bored. Fortunately, the situation never escalated into anything worse, considering Townsend had what police called a shrine to Lincoln Park in her home, along with hundreds of private photos of Bennington and his wife and kids. Side Projects Although Chester Bennington worked mainly with Lincoln Park, he also sought other creative outlets for his music. In 2008, in the wake of Lincoln Park's Minutes to Midnight, Bennington formed a new band called Dead by Sunrise, saying, I came up with a few songs that felt and sounded really good, but I knew they weren't right stylistically for Linkin Park, so I decided to work on them on my own rather than turn them over and have them transformed into Linkin Park tracks. Bennington had also confessed to being a huge fan of Stone Temple Pilots, so it must have been a dream come true when Bennington was asked to front the band in 2013 after frontman Scott Weiland left the group. The collaboration lasted two years, and in November 2015, Bennington amicably left the group to spend more time with his family and to focus on Linkin Park. Open to Collaborations Thanks in part to superstar producer Rick Rubin, Linkin Park moved past their early new metal rap rock sound, and Bennington in particular seemed motivated to not be tied down by a genre. He told Rock Sound, 
It doesn't matter what style we write in, as long as it comes from a pure place and it's something that we pour our hearts and souls into, we can deal with what happens from that point forward. Mike Shinoda was giving me litmus tests like, hey, what would you say if I said, let's do a collaboration with Katy Perry or Kelly Clarkson? And I was like, F yeah, I actually really like pop music. It was just a test to see if I'd go, absolutely not, that makes me want to puke, or if I'd be open to the idea, and I'm pretty much open to anything. Okay, maybe the world wasn't ready for a Katy Perry Linkin Park mashup, but those words definitely ring true, considering Linkin Park's past collaborations with artists like Jay Z and Busta Rhymes, not to mention their surprisingly emotional cover of Adele's Rolling in the Deep. Take me back in time and reach just what you saw. Charity Work while Linkin Park's lyrics often focus on the darker side of life, in real life, the band always put an emphasis on improving life for others through charity work. Possibly stemming from his own battles with addiction, Chester Bennington passionately worked to help recovering addicts through the Music Cares MAP Fund. He told Loudwire, Music Cares MAP Fund is an amazing program that takes care of their own and actually saves lives. It's been so rewarding to support them and see firsthand what they've accomplished for so many artists. Given Bennington's troubled past with addiction, his contributions to combat substance abuse are particularly inspiring. In 2013, Bennington received the Stevie Ray Vaughan Award for his charity work. Found on Chris Cornell's birthday On May 18, 2017, the world mourned the loss of former Soundgarden and audio slave singer Chris Cornell when he took his own life in a hotel room in Detroit. Bennington and Linkin Park guitarist Brad Delson performed Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah at Cornell's funeral, and Bennington penned a heartbreaking letter to Cornell, saying, I'm still weeping with sadness, as well as gratitude for having shared some very special moments with you and your beautiful family. I can't imagine a world without you in it. I pray you find peace in the next life. Bennington was clearly deeply affected by the suicide of his close friend and fellow musician, and the world found a new reason to mourn soon after. On July 20, 2017, which would have been Cornell's 53rd birthday, TMZ reported that Bennington had taken his own life in his Los Angeles home at the age of 41. Not Forgotten Reactions from fans and fellow musicians came pouring in following the news of Chester Bennington's death. Even filmmaker Joss Whedon paid tribute, tweeting, A thousand sons got me through a horribly dark time. I'm indebted. Thank you and rest in peace, Chester Bennington. Wish you were here. Though Bennington left the world too soon, his legacy will live on. Over nearly two decades of music, he gave the world something that can never be taken away, the pieces of himself he poured into his music. Critics may not always have been kind to Chester Bennington, but his music spoke directly to fans in a way few things can, and he will live on through his words and songs for decades to come.